Hey, welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar. Today we're covering uh, strategies for success with aluminum zinc coated roofs, which is presented by Steelscape. Uh, today's webinar is part of the Metal Architecture webinar series. I'm Paul Deppenbaugh. I'm the editorial director at Metal Architecture. And uh, we're glad you've joined us. Michelle Vondren from Steelscape is back for this presentation and I'm gonna turn things over to her in a moment, but uh, I wanna go through a couple of notes first. Uh, Michelle knows this subject front to back, so you're going to want to ask questions. Um, use the panel on your screen to submit them. I'll raise them with her at the end of each section. There are four sections, so three times in the middle of the presentation and once at the end, I'll raise questions with her. Um, listen up for those of you who need AIA credits or certificates. They're going to be handled automatically. Please allow seven business days for everything to process. Tomorrow, you're going to receive an email with links to more information and ways to ask technical questions and a place to view the webinar again. It will also have a reminder about those AIA credits and certificates being handled automatically. So I'm going to turn things over to Michelle here. Uh, Michelle Vondren is the technical manager for NS Blue Scope Coded Products North America. She graduated from California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo with a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. She started her career as a research chemist with Morton, which later became BASF, coil coatings with a focus on polymers. This position also included lab development as well as lab to production scale up and manufacturing quality and process control. Eventually, Michelle's focus shifted to cool pigmentation where she brought the first coil coatings to cool coil coatings to market um, Michelle was active in the Cool Roof Rating Council and the Energy, Energy Star Roofing Program. She joined Steelscape as a quality engineer for the Rancho Cucamonga, California paint line. And while there, she has held a quality systems manager role and is now technical manager. She oversees quality systems and technical service for Blue Scope Coated Products North America, which is comprised of Steelscape and ASC profiles. Michelle's an active member of the National Coil Coders Association, sitting on the technical committee, as well as the Zinc Aluminum Coders Association. Like I said, she knows her stuff. Michelle, take it away. Thank you, Paul. It's always a very grand uh, introduction that I have to try to live up to. Appreciate that. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to you. And we will jump right in. Um, a uh, little overview real quick, you probably already know this, it's one credit, uh, no prior uh, knowledge or expertise was needed, and the contact is Sean Page at Steelscape uh, for any follow-up uh, information. Uh, we've broken this down into four sections, uh, objectives today, understanding what an aluminum zinc metallic coated steel is, um, the most common types of roofs that we see this used in, and then some design um, information for longevity and how to get the best out of this product. And then some installation and maintenance um, sort of stories and caveats to go over. So what is an aluminum zinc metallic coated steel roof? Well, it's uh, most commonly known as Galvalum or Zincalum. Those are trade names you may have seen out there in the market. Um, it's a steel base that's coated with an aluminum zinc mixture to provide superior corrosion resistance. Mm -hmm. It comes in many, many forms. It can be bare painted, uh, easily formed and shaped into all kinds of different products. Our focus here today is obviously roofs and maybe some wall panels, but can be used for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about the coating, or the science and the development of the coating, its advantages, and then uh, use in the real world. Mm -hmm. So what is the purpose of the metallic coating? Well, it's corrosion resistance, right? We all know that steel um, in and of itself doesn't do very well exposed uh, to the elements, right? It corrodes right away. So um, galvanized steel, zinc coated steel has been around a really, really long time. Everyone's fairly familiar with that. And then uh, several decades ago now, um, people thought, well, can we make that better, right? Can we get a better metallic coating? Um, and that's when this aluminum zinc combination was developed. So what we have here is a little diagram, a cross section of what a painted um, zinc aluminum coated steel sheet would look like. Got your steel in the middle there. The yellow would be the very thin metallic coating layer. Then you would have some primer and then your paint on a painted product. Um, 
this mixture is both an active and a and a non-active coating. So the zinc portion is actively protecting the base steel, where the aluminum is fairly inert and serves as a barrier protection uh, to the steel underneath. So this combination greatly reduces the rate of corrosion, but does not stop it completely. I mean, this product will over time have some corrosion, but at a much, much lower rate um, than regular zinc coated or galvanized product. <laughs> So real quick, um, just I want to make sure everyone understands the process a little bit and, and that what we're talking about today is coil. So we start with a base of uh, steel wrapped up in coil form. It goes through a production line and gets its metallic coating applied. If it's going to get painted, it then moves to a paint line where it's painted. And then it's transported out to the end users and manufacturers who will make wall and roof panels out of it. This is a diagram of a, a generic metallic coating line. These lines run continuously anywhere from 150 to 700, 800 feet a minute. So it's a very fast process. It is continuous. We weld the end of one coil to another and keep running. Um, most metallic coating lines, modern ones, hold anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 linear feet of steel in them from end to end. So it's a very large scale manufacturing. Starting left to right, we load, um, we got two coils uh, on the payoff reels and goes through the entry accumulator. These accumulator towers are what allow us to run continuously by changing the length of the line. Those rolls move up and down to either lengthen the line or shorten the line. Goes through a cleaning section. We gotta get that steel really clean, get all the oxides and debris off of it before we coat it. Goes through an annealing furnace. So we're doing two things on this line, right? We're going to apply the metallic coating, but first we need to get the steel annealed to its correct mechanical properties and grade specifications for the end use. So that happens in the annealing furnace. Comes out of the furnace, heads into the molten pot, uh, which I'll show in a little bit more detail in the next slide. So that's the molten bath of aluminum and zinc mixed in there in the right proportions. The strip goes through there, gets its uh, coating put on, we control that coating with a set of air knives, high air pressure that uh, thins it out to the right thickness and weight. Gets cooled down um, pretty much almost to room temperature, but uh, significant cooling takes place. Then goes through a skin pass mill if it's going to be painted or a skin conditioning mill. That really gives you an extra smooth surface for painted product. And then it goes through a tension leveler, which corrects any shape, so we have a nice flat product. Um, and then at the exit end of these lines, uh, if it's going to be bare product and not get painted, you might put some chemical treatment on it to help prevent corrosion or a clear resin product, um, which prevents fingerprinting on the strip and also aids in roll forming uh, if it's not going to be painted. And then the coil is wound up and off it goes to its next process. This is sort of a blown up diagram of the furnace and pot section. This is really where all the action happens on these production lines. This happens to be a diagram of the steelscape metallic coating lines, which are direct fired furnace. Not all lines are direct fired furnace, but this one is actually impinging flame onto the strip. Helps anneal the steel, clean the steel, get it to its right properties, goes through a set of um, radiant tubes and electrical tubes at different temperatures to finalize and, and set those mechanical properties in place. And then the strip um, comes down into the molten bath. Um, the strip temperature is very, very critical and the temperature in the pot is very critical to get this metallic coating to adhere. Uh, and then it goes up through the air knives uh, to get its correct coating weight. These are some pictures of an actual line. So again, left to right, uh, steel coils being staged for entry into the line. Then the accumulators that take up the slack or let it out so we can run continuously. Um, in the steelscape world, these are vertical and they're about eight to nine stories high. Some lines are horizontal, different ways to construct. Um, this picture in the middle here going through the molten bath, um, that shiny reflective surface you see is the metallic coating right after it's applied to the strip. The bar that says Kohler there and the one that sits above it are the air knives uh, that are uh, controlling the coating weight. And then the cooling starts in this structure right above it. And then we do a bunch of final QC and inspection processes at the end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is this coating, right? So it's 55% aluminum, 43.5% zinc, 1.5% silicon. 
this is by weight, not volume. This is weight. Mm -hmm. um, the zinc provides the sacrificial galvanic uh, protection from corrosion. The aluminum provides a protective barrier, also called passivation mm -hmm. uh, in the industry. The silicon is in there really to control the reaction and the wetting of the surface in the pot. It doesn't really do much once it's on the final product, but it controls the thermodynamics that are occurring. And again, by comparison, hot dip galvanized is zinc only. Same process, manufactured almost the same, but it's only zinc. What happens is that the zinc areas will corrode pre preferentially to uh, protect the base steel, which then leaves the aluminum areas uh, as a protective barrier to retain the bond with the paint if it's painted and also the steel underneath. Uh, and that's what dramatically slows down the corrosion rate versus zinc only. Here we have, um, this is at a microscopic level, what we're talking about. So on the left here is just hot dip galvanized and it's all zinc. Uh, the little uh, crystalline structures here are where that zinc layer alloys with the steel and bonds to it. On the right is um, galvalume or zinc loom product. In this, the gray area, the gray matter, sort of looks like a brain gray matter, is the aluminum, right? So because it's by weight and you know aluminum is, you know, density is quite a bit different than zinc, you end up with a lot of aluminum by volume mm -hmm. on the strip. So that's the bulk of it. The little white areas, tunnels, uh, also known as dendrites, are the zinc rich areas. Mm -hmm. So what'll happen once it's out in the field, the zinc areas will corrode first, mm -hmm. right? Sacrifice itself for the aluminum and the steel. And then you're left with all this aluminum still in here as protection, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot because mm -hmm. uh, it's so much more by volume. Mm -hmm. The history of this product's really interesting. Um, we could do a whole hour just on it if we wanted to. Um, it was developed by Bethlehem Steel. Uh, the first commercial uh, trademarked name, Galvalume, was sold in June in 1972, but it was in development for quite a long time before that. Um, I've, heard, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the original scientists, metallurgists who worked on this product, and they, they tell a lot of really interesting stories. My favorite is, is that Bethlehem was about to pull the plug on this product because um, they thought it was taking too long. They were spending too much money to develop it. And one of the lead scientists forced his way into a limousine with the head of Bethlehem Steel, who was on his way to a black tie event. And for an hour in the limousine pleaded his case to please keep this project alive. And in the end convinced him, uh, which ended up revolutionizing the coated steel industry with this product. It was a giant leap forward from straight galvanized. So fascinating to hear uh, the trials and tribulations. It is a licensed uh, material. You do have to have a license, uh, which is managed by an organization called the BIEC, which was formed after, after Bethlehem Steel um, was, was sold out. Um, you have to have a license to call it galvalume or zinc alum. Uh, if you do not, you have to refer to it as, as aluminum zinc. Can't use the trade name. Uh, it's in 28 countries now. I think here in the U.S. there are six or seven license holders right now in the United States, so fair amount. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now, you know, since uh, they put some roofs out in the 60s before they commercially were selling it in 1972, so we've got close to 50 years of real world exposure on this product now. And it's looking very, very good. Um, you know, everyone was gonna be happy with 20 to 30 years originally, and it, it's proving to be much, much better than that. So you can see the pictures on the right here that, uh, you know, 20 years, and this is an acid rain environment. So sort of a harsh environment back East, um, 20 years looks good, 25 looks good. What we're starting to see at 25, 30 years and beyond is that these Galvalum panels are outlasting and outperforming the other components on the building. Mm -hmm. um, so that's becoming a problem is that the uh, other building construction items are not uh, holding up as well. Mm -hmm. And right now there's about 30 billion square feet of this material in use today. Mm -hmm. So again, why aluminum and zinc, <laughs> right? Just to recap. So it's just superior performance for corrosion, both bare and painted. Uh, most Galvalum license holders do provide a corrosion warranty for this product, anywhere from 20 to 25 and a half years. That's not something you'll get on any other coated substrate. Uh, you do, because of the density of the aluminum, 
uh, versus all zinc. You do get more linear footage uh, of this product for weight, so there's sort of an advantage there on the purchasing side. Readily formable into just about any kind of uh, construction material you want to use it for. And it has great aesthetics. It looks very nice bare. This is a bare application uh, with no paint on it. It has a very nice look, but also paints incredibly well. Too. And here's just some stats, uh, real world testing, right? So this is at the bottom years to 5% red rust, which is very little red rust out in, in the world. And you can see that even in a severe marine environment, this product holds up very, very well. Um, and moderate marine even is really no different than non-marine settings. Uh, so it's a really great product for a lot of applications. This is my little attempt to show what's really going on here. So on the left, we have galvanized. So say you've got painted galvanized out in the field and there's a scratch through the paint. Something happens, you get a scratch through the paint. Now the zinc layer is showing. That zinc layer is going to corrode and corrode and corrode away until eventually there's nothing left and you're down to steel, at which point you're going to get red rust bleeding through uh, to the surface, you know, which looks terrible and also uh, results in the paint not having anything left to adhere to. So now you've got paint peeling off and bubbling off, which looks unsightly. Mm -hmm. However, with the aluminum zinc product, in this example, the yellow is the aluminum and the red would be the zinc. You know, you get the same scratch and yeah, that zinc part goes away, but you're still left with all this aluminum there that's protecting the steel and gives something for the paint to still attach to. So you don't see quite the degradation that you get on straight zinc. And the rate of corrosion is um, slowed by like four times, four to nine times compared to galvanized, depending on the environment that it goes into. Same thing on the, the drip edge or cut edge, uh, which is really the greatest risk out on a roof application. So again, got a drip edge here. The zinc on galvanized starts to wear away, is sacrificing itself. Now you have nothing holding the paint. So you've got this paint flapping out here in the breeze. It usually breaks off, peels off, which just accelerates the whole process because now more zinc is exposed. It corrodes. You're down to base steel and red rust. And we call that edge creep, which is the progression of rust up from the edge of the panel. But once again, on the uh, galvalum or zinc alum product, yeah, that zinc goes away, but you're still left with all this aluminum on the edge. Um, and the paint might start to come loose a little bit, but it's not going to come loose like it does on galvanized. And it's not going to happen as quickly. Uh, so that edge stays protected much longer. And I love real pictures, right? It always tells the story better than uh, my little diagrams do. But um, these panels on the right here were exposed in the exact same location for the same amount of years. Uh, galvanized on the bottom, galvalum product on the top. And you can see the difference. Yeah, there's some corrosion going on with the Gavilum product, but you're not getting this unsightly red rust, and it's certainly not as extreme. So usually most of that edge corrosion on Gavilum occurs in the first couple of years. That's what this graph shows here, right? So it's progressing, but then it really levels out and plateaus after you know two to three years and just slows down almost completely. Um, one caveat here is that in those first couple years, galvanized does sometimes outperform the galvalum product, but then there's an inversion that takes place of performance. And the galvanized will continue to corrode up this chart while the galvalum goes flat. So we do see a reversal after the first couple years. So the numbers, there's a lot of numbers associated with this that you might see in specs. Um, the ASTM that governs this product is A792. We see that called out um, in the architectural specs all the time. And there's different coating rate, uh, weights. So that's how much of this mixture are you putting on there? AZ55, AZ50, and AZ35 are the most common. This is weight per square foot. So AZ55 is 55 ounces per square foot. That's total, both sides. That is only about 0 0.0018 inches, so it's very, very thin. AZ50 is the other most common weight now. It's probably the majority of what we see spec'd and used, and it's 0 0.0016 inches uh, on the surface. The AZ50s, the AZ55s, and higher. We do see higher coating weights for like um, heavy industrial use, pipe usage, um, that kind of thing. And um, those will be warranted generally for the corrosion. 
But anything less than that is not. The AZ35, which is a low coating weight, will not be warranted. And you also cannot use the name Galvalum with it, mm. even if you have a license, because it's just not going to offer the same protection. The charts on the right here show sort of the, um, the aluminum content by by weight against the time to first rust, right? Because when they first developed this product, they're like, well, how much aluminum do we need, you know? And what they found is that the 55% the that they ended up uh, coming up with was really critical. Um, you can see that at the lower weights, um, and there's a big difference in performance uh, as you jump that aluminum content up. So going back to the coating weights, um, and a little explanation as to why this thinner coating weight can be problematic in exterior applications. So this is scanning electron microscope. So we're looking at the microscopic levels. And uh, in this case, the white is the aluminum. So all this white fluffy stuff is the aluminum. The dark gray is the zinc tunnels or zinc uh, dendrites. You can see on the, the lower coating weight at the top here that some of those zinc tunnels come all the way down to the steel surface right so now once those get corroded away you're going to have a direct path to the base steel whereas in the higher coating weights those dendrites don't usually come all the way down um, and you have a lot more aluminum there to continue protecting the surface uh, so that's why the higher coating weights are warranted and are better for external um, exterior use um, so this product has some really good other um, attributes as well. Uh, it's got high uh, solar reflectance values, SRI values, um, you know, so it's great for cool roof applications and energy, you know, energy stars being sunsetted for roofing, but it is on the energy star list. It's readily paintable, looks fantastic when it's painted. It's a great surface. Can withstand about uh, 600 feet Fahrenheit consistently without discoloration up to 1250 Fahrenheit without oxidation. So it can be used in places where um, high heat is a concern. It can be, uh, the bare product can be field painted as well and powder coated if that's desired. Uh, if, it, if someone doesn't want it pre-painted, they can paint it um, post installation. Can be welded except for painted products, which is the case uh, for galvanized as well because it'll destroy the painted surface, but bare can be welded. Mm -hmm. And then we've got some examples. So bare uh, galvalume uh, SRI is usually around 64 uh, on average. And again, you guys are as familiar with this as me, I'm sure, is the lead requirements. And here are some of the categories where this product can get you some points and credits, again, for the, the heat island reduction, the cool roof, but then also the material ingredient uh, reporting uh, the bare or plus format, which is the resin coated, um, has been fully disclosed. Uh, it also has uh, LBC red list free um, certification as well. We're struggling a little bit in all honesty with the painted product because the paint vendors don't really want to give up their secret recipes and proprietary formulation information. So working closely with them on how to disclose that for both lead and living building challenge uh, properly. We do need to talk about suitable and unsuitable uh, environments for the Galvalum product. Mm, there are a few areas where it really shouldn't be used, um, and that's high alkaline environments. So uh, the high alkaline will attack the um, aluminum component. Mm, so animal confinement, um, direct contact with wet cement is problematic. Uh, low slopes without proper water drainage, but that sort of applies to all metal roof products, it causes corrosion. Dissimilar metals in a corrosive environment can be problematic, and we actually have several slides on that later on, so we'll dig into that a little bit deeper. And then buried in soil, um, the zinc aluminum product doesn't do well in soil. It really um, degrades quite quickly, so you want to stick to galvanized for those kind of applications. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of the first section. So we'll see if there's any questions from anyone. So there are a couple of questions and uh, I think everybody's uh, remembering their chemistry classes. Um, Jessica asks, if you paint it, does the reflectivity of the galvalume 
decrease. And I think you talked about that a little bit when you had the slide about SRIs, and I think it probably leads into your cool roofing issues as well. Yeah, so once it's painted, the paint really dictates the SRI values at that point, not the substrate. Um, and, uh, I have another question about hail damage, and is that a major issue over time? Even on those 50-year roofs, did you, if, if there were several hail storms, how did they perform in that environment? Yeah, hail can be problematic, and I actually uh, have to address several of those a year. Um, if the hail is bad enough that it causes an opening in that metallic coating, uh, which has to be pretty severe hail, uh, most of these form uh, roof panels have really good hail resistance, but if it's bad enough that it cracks or fractures the metallic coating, then yes, you're gonna end up getting red rust steel corrosion in those spots. So a really good inspection is required after hail storms, um, and, and you know, to really look down at that level. Um, but it has to be pretty bad hail for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then one question you said there, I think uh, was six licensees for Galvo in this country. Are there, is there a, a, a counterfeit products that are hitting the market at all that people should be careful of? I don't know if counterfeit's the right word. There are companies producing an aluminum zinc metallic coated steel that are not licensed. Um, I, sometimes they try to call a galvalum and get away with that. Uh, you gotta, so you gotta be a little careful. The concern with those unlicensed products is whether they're really adhering to the criteria that's been set up as to how to make this material, how to produce it, how to quality check it, um, and the consistency of it. So when you have a license, uh, the BIC actually comes in and will help a company build these manufacturing lines and does routine audits of those of us that have a license to make sure that we are adhering uh, to the standards set forth under the license. So um, yeah, there could be product out there sold as aluminum zinc, and it may not be truly 55% aluminum. It may not, you know, and there's good companies and bad ones. I'm sure that there's folks that are adhering to the same criteria without the license and there's those that aren't, unfortunately. Great, and I, I know you've got a bunch more and I wanna ask one more question. It's I think a fairly simple one. Um, uh, you talk about environments where this kind of coating is not suitable and uh, um, Alex is asking about, can you put it like near a pool, 10 feet away from a pool? And I don't know whether that's indoor or outdoor pool. Uh, I don't know why it would be an indoor for this kind of product. But yeah, typically we uh, typically if there's not if there's good airflow and ventilation, um, I mean a roof adjacent to a pool, an outdoor pool is pro is not going to be problematic. Um, indoor could be, but you know typically there's really good ventilation and then there's a barrier of insulation between the pool and the roof panels, so it's sort of a non-concern. But yeah, I've seen lots of zinc loom or, or gavelum roofs on very nice houses with very nice outdoor pools in close proximity, and it, it hasn't been problematic. Thank you. And I, I will let you go on now, um, but people, please continue to uh, submit your questions. Yeah, Thanks. great questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. So now we're going to get a little bit more into actual roof types um, and advantages and disadvantages of those. So what are the two most common types of metal roofs we see um, this product used for? And it's exposed fastener roofs, so like your corrugated panels, box rib panels, trapezoidal panels, and then your concealed fastened uh, roofs, which would be your standing seam type roofing. You know, this is widely available, this product, and goes well into all of these applications. Um, so really then the differences become the type of panels uh, that you're installing and how they're uh, installed. So, you know, pretty straightforward. A lot of you probably know as much about this as, as I do or more, um, right? Concealed fastened, you're not gonna have any kind of fasteners exposed, standing seam, snap lock or snap seam, mechanically seamed or batten style roofs fall in that category. And then the exposed fasten, like I said, the, the corrugated trapezoidal styles, and then some metal shingles and tiles that are being made are an exposed fasten mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about the snap seam, uh, standing seam first. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty straightforward, right? You make a panel, there's a flange with a connection point, um, either a fastener or a clip. 
that goes in and then the other panel lays over the top snaps into place <laughs> can lay one after the other they're interlocked this is a um, really prolific in the residential uh, roofing market it's got good performance but also fairly easy to install for most installers no special knowledge or tools are really needed so usually uh, these panels are made with some kind of striation or forming in the pan which helps reduce oil canning which is uh, for those maybe not familiar with that which is the buckling or pillowing that you see on metal roofs sometimes that occurs um, actually a common problem with light gauge steel roofing is that uh, oil canning or buckling appearance and then yeah you would want to use a clip for longer spans and greater performance requirements to allow for some thermal movement and expansion mechanically seamed um, these are structurally quite sound we see this mostly in commercial applications but some residential as well right the seams uh the panels join together and then either um, manually or with an automatic seamer a device runs up that and interlocks and folds that over and actually seams them together uh, these kind of panels will often have uh, high wind uplift ratings ul ratings they're good for lower slope applications as well because they're waterproof and, and watertight they are more expensive to install they're more labor intensive you do need an installer who really knows what they're doing and is familiar with this kind of product some of these are so structurally sound they can be applied over open framing as well so that's an advantage and you always use a floating clip uh, on these for thermal movement then the other sort of last uh, kind of concealed type is the batten or, or t style so use a clip um, on the two panels and then you apply the batten or that cover piece over it to hide it and snap that into uh, place this gives you a little bit greater flexibility in the width of that panel the pan width mm. and then the batten width right can give you some different design elements can also curve taper um, and do some other shapes with these panels which comes in handy for uh, design purposes is labor intensive uh, probably will require some gaskets and sealants for uh, weather tightness as well and then the T panel is the last one's very similar um, where you have sort of a T intersection between the two panels and then a, a batten that goes over that and has pretty high panel performance when it's done. Mm -hmm. The exposed uh, traditional panels, um, a lot of them are called R panels or U panels. Um, very common again in residential, um, you know, light commercial agricultural mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm easy to install but has very good strength um, and looks nice when it's finished the sort of 5v crimp example that we have here at the bottom is sort of a quote fake or a foul faux standing seam um, although it's an exposed fastener when it's done from a distance it can look quite a bit like a standing seam roof but obviously it's a little bit easier to install um, it doesn't require quite the expertise And then we get into uh, traditional corrugated, right? So this is a, uh, you know, the old style sort of tin roofs that um, probably most of us knew when we were younger before we got more into this world. And um, we're seeing this a lot right now, both in commercial and residential, um, especially for roof, uh, and, or not roof, for wall applications, sorry, you know, both vertical and horizontal, right? Really is a nice design element um, being used with other types of panels as well. And same with the trapezoid or the box rib panels, which have that deeper square look. Uh, seeing a lot of the use of that for wall, both vertical and horizontal in commercial and residential, um, even some interior uh, work design elements as well. Uh, looks really good. And then we get into to metal tiles or shingles. Um, I think a lot of people don't even realize that these exist. I think they're driving past roofs uh, that look like shingle or tile and people don't realize they're metal, right? Unless you went up and touched them, it would be hard to tell the difference. But um, these are typically, you know, it's fastened, one is down, the next panel overlap it and you continue and then you have a cover at the end. Um, and they come in a lot of different profiles. Some of them are stamped, some are roll formed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a it's a great look. And then you may be also familiar with the stone coated product, um, 
sometimes they apply a base layer of glue and then stone to these to make them look like asphalt shingles. And that's a really nice durable product. <laughs> High end, mostly residential. <laughs> so we'll review real quick sort of the uh, differences between these two, fairly self-explanatory. Um, exposed is, you know, more cost effective, easier to install, less expertise needed. Wide variety of patterns available in that, in those shapes, um, you know. Do you sometimes have to consider thermal movement? Uh, if you've got a fixed attachment point, that can be problematic over time, right? You'll get some elongation that occurs in that hole. Not great for low slope or long lengths. You'd want to move up to a concealed uh, panel for that. May need to use some steel and mastic to get a good weather tight seal on these as well. Some can be curved. Um, and then the concealed, right? So this is a cleaner look for larger areas, larger spans, superior weather tightness, great for thermal movement. Uh, again, great wind uplift and hail resistance on these. Can be formed on site or in extra long lengths. Um, see that a lot. Can be tapered or curved and better suited for uh, low slope applications. Some things to consider. Um, especially for our designers and architects is the look, right? And, and what all of these different kind of panels bring to the table. So rib height, so uh, rib height and seams, what, what does that look like? What kind of shadows does it cast? What's the aesthetic of that when it's installed? The width of the panel, right? That span, not only aesthetically, but you know, is there anything else that has to be attached to the roof that's gonna be problematic uh, with the panel chosen? Obviously, environmental loads, uh, snow loads, ice loads, those kind of things, wind, if you're in a high hail area. Um, again, we talked about accessories, walkways, solar panels, right, might dictate the kind of panel you need to go with, not only structurally, but how it looks. Oil canning, we talked about that, avoiding that buckling appearance that you can get. The thicker the, the steel, um, and the more forming you have in the panel will eliminate that. Mm. Uh, paint system, if it's gonna be painted, that's a whole nother presentation, maybe some of you have sat in. Uh, that has to be considered, is it the right paint for the environment and the application? And then manufacturing compliance, right? Is there any third party required testing, UL testing or anything else out there that has to be certified and documented uh, for the project? Mm. Okay, we're back to questions. Another oh, round. And, and we have a couple. I'm trying to keep up with this. Uh, there were a couple of questions, and you mentioned it just at the end about coatings. Um, uh, and we, you have done a presentation on pre-painted coatings, so I don't want to kind of repeat all that. Okay. But one question from uh, Gail is about, uh, she's asking about whether the clear coat and does it wear down to the top coat. And, and her concern is about uh, the ability to do rainwater harvesting on these kinds of roofs and, and if there's any kind of uh, uh, contamination that happens because of that. Um, in general, these roofs, both bare and painted, are excellent for harvesting rainwater and there's not a lot of concern, but I have to put a caveat, sort of a, a cover yourself statement in there. Um, for, for non-potable, non-drinking water, safe. I mean, there's really nothing to worry about. Um, you probably need to be more concerned about the quality of the rain where you live and anything else that might be falling on the roof, right, from the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. For drinking water purposes, um, you know, that that's tough because the definition of safe drinking water varies uh, by region and area. And it's really hard to define what safe means. Uh, we, our recommendation is if you wanted to collect rainwater for drinking, it needs to go through some kind of purification and filter system first. Um, and again, not necessarily because of what might be coming from the roof panels or the paint, but also what's in your rainwater when it hits the roof, right? Um, there could be other contaminants there that need to be dealt with. So, but no, metal roofs are excellent. And I know that, um, especially in Hawaii, they do a lot of metal uh, gavelum roofs in Hawaii, um, and they all collect water. I mean, almost everyone collects rainwater for some kind of use there. Very, very common. And we see it a lot in Texas as well, Texas and Arizona, New Mexico. We see it used for that quite often. Um, and I had several questions about uh, who's licensed to uh, use 
Galvalume, and I'll just direct the audience to uh, a website, www.galvalume.com, which has a complete list of licensees on it. So you can Correct, get that there. Yeah. But for you, Michelle, um, it, it, I, I lost track of my own questions here. Um, do coders need to be licensed? The, the paint coders, no. Okay. Um, the only one who has to be licensed is the producing is the producer of the substrate itself. So, um, like U.S. Steel, I'll use U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel has a Galvalume license. They produce a lot of Galvalume, uh, probably the biggest producer in the United States. Um, but they don't do any painting, right? All those coils go somewhere else to get painted, and that's fine. The, the painting part of it doesn't need any kind of license. Um, there's a couple of us like Steelscape and some other Steel Dynamics. Um, who do everything in house? Uh, that's just the way we're set up. But no, that the coders, the paint coders, don't need any kind of special licensing. All right. Well, uh, let's let you get back to it and uh, continue to submit your questions, please. Okay. Uh, now we're going to talk about um, designing uh, with this product for longevity. So, does the slope of the roof matter? Well, yeah, obviously. I think. Um, you know, you don't want standing water, right? Um, you don't want standing water really on any roof if it can be avoided, but especially on steel and metal roofs, whether it's uh, aluminum zinc coated or just zinc coated. Mm -hmm. Right, because this can really influence the, the life expectancy of the product. So uh, the recommendation uh, for Galvalume is typically uh, uh, no less than a quarter in 12, which is pretty low, slow. Uh, at the end of the day, but you got to have some water drainage. And there's a couple ways, you know, if you're going to go with low slope, definitely go with a concealed fastener standing seam type profile. And then deeper pans uh, in the panels help for water shedding, helps aid that. And uh, what we have here is an example of a roof where uh, water was able to pond over time. And you know, on a painted product, it's going to deteriorate the paint and then eventually deteriorate the substrate. Uh, at the very least, you're going to get this sort of unsightly staining um, and even some mold growth um, that might occur on the panels, which looks bad. Attachments. So, right, these are the other things that might go on a roof, walkways, catways, solar panels, right, that could interfere with washing, could interfere uh, or result in debris buildup. Uh, that could cause corrosion, right? So you got to make sure that none of these kind of attachments or accessories um, are contributing to that. Want to be able to have good self-cleaning when it rains. <laughs> Things can wash off and drain off good. Don't want accumulation of leaves and dirt or salt anywhere because that's going to eat through the coating uh, quickly. Good airflow, uh, which you really you need for uh, solar panels anyways. And then you want to make sure that any uh, of those attachment points are, are out of a, a material that's compatible uh, with the galvalume because you don't want galvanic corrosion. And we're going to talk about that in uh, more detail. Mm -hmm. The other uh, issue we have to worry about, especially in commercial or industrial applications, is fallout from boilers, heaters, any kind of exhaust fans. Um, that are on the roof, right? Got to make sure that uh, they're in a good location, preferably where prevailing winds can clean that out and blow it off. Make sure that the height is is well above the roof um, to help prevent uh, accumulation. We have a picture there of um, sort of what not to do, right? So this is a bare galvalume roof that's had a lot of fallout from this chimney right here, and you can see that it's turning it black over time. So dissimilar metals, this is a big deal. Um, and I would say that the vast majority of warranty claims that I see on the Galvalume product ends up being because of dissimilar metals. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a big deal. And what happens is it's, it's you know, we're going to go back to a little high school uh, chemistry and science here, right? It's a battery effect, right? You've got uh, an anode and a cathode that gets created. And if you're in a corrosive environment, mm -hmm you get this reaction that occurs between the two where the anode starts to sacrifice itself preferably to the cathode right um so this is a, a simple galvanic chart the further apart two items are on this list the greater the potential for this corrosion to occur you will see down here at the bottom we have galvanized steel and aluminum the galvalume product falls right in between those two 
And then you go up to the top and we look at things like stainless steel, hmm? um, chromium plating, copper. These are common materials we see being used for fasteners or for trim or flashings that if they're in direct contact hmm, with the aluminum zinc product hmm, and it's a corrosive environment like near the ocean is gonna be problematic. Um, and we will see that the gabalum product will sacrifice itself very, very quickly to protect these other substances. Mm -hmm. um, so really a big deal. And there's lots of technical bulletins out there on this. All of us that license this product and make it have a set of technical bulletins that cover all of these topics more in depth. Uh, so I highly recommend if anyone's going to work with this product um, that they're familiar with it. It covers everything from installation to storage before installation. Um, and how to pick the right fasteners and attachments. Um, so again, right, trim and flashings and gutters can be problematic. Ideally, you would want to make all of those out of the same coil and base material that you're doing the roof panels out of. Um, painted aluminum is good to use as well. It's quite compatible, um, and aluminum fasteners and attachments are fine. Galvanized, you don't have the corrosion potential, but the galvanized is not going to last as long. We talked about that uh, early on, right? It's going to corrode quicker. So that could be problematic if you're wanting 30, 40 years of life out of a building. You're going to have to replace those other components pretty quick. Uh, copper is sort of a no-no all the time with galvalum. Um, we'll see an example of that here momentarily. And of course, you always want to make sure, again, no standing water, right? That you have a proper fall and runoff. <laughs> Here is my copper example. This is a uh, cautionary tale out of Hawaii. This is the police station in Kauai. Um, they put this beautiful green painted galvalume roof on and this beautiful copper fascia, both at the top and the bottom. I uh, got a call, the building was about a year old. They said, look, it's a year old. We've got red rust already. What's happening? You can see the red rust on the, the drip edges there. So we went out and looked at it. And what we found is that while this copper fascia, right, you want the water to run from the zinc alum or, or gabalum to the copper, not the other way. So that was correct. But because of winds and the rain patterns here on the island and where this side of the building faced, water was running off the copper fascia from the top onto the panels below and causing premature corrosion of the gabalum. So even when you think you're safe, sometimes. Um, weather gets you in the end. Other things to consider, um, right? So galvalume or zinc uh, expands and contracts the same as other metals, same as galvanized. No differences there. Of course, you have to keep that uh, in mind. Uh, our architectural engineers and, and structural engineers have to keep that in mind um, for expansion and contraction. Obviously, the longer the panel, the more movement you might have. You got to use the right clips to, to float that and compensate for that. Um, you know, if you're going directly to wood or steel purlins, uh, that can relieve some of the, the thermal movement on smaller panel lengths. Um, you know, a simple design is a one-piece clip fixed to the substrate floating connection with the panel, um, and the clip doesn't move. You can also use a dual clip design uh, where the clip is fixed to the panel and base, but has a floating slipping component um, within itself, uh, so you get double movement. Panels still uh, have to be pinned uh, in one location to address loads. And again, environmental concerns. Wind uplift, that's a big one, right? Uh, maybe not so much out here where I live on the West Coast, but you know, Tornado Alley, hurricane regions, big deal. Uh, air and water infiltration rates, product loads such as snow and ice uh, can be really detrimental to roofs, uh, believe it or not. Uh, they create a lot of load and is uh, not only the load themselves, but when it slides down, if you don't have snow stops, it slides down these panels, it can really tear the paint system up. Uh, so ice dam prevention and then coastal protection. That's a big one for those of us out here in the West. Um, a lot of marine environment. Uh, Got to make sure you have the right substrate uh, and the right paint system for that to get longevity. And again, this is my caveat for me. Uh, I am in no way an engineer. <laughs> I know enough about this to be dangerous. Um, I'm not an expert in panel design. So we definitely recommend um, that you, you talk directly to a panel manufacturer who usually have engineers on staff that can get into a lot more detail uh, from a structural load and engineering perspective with you. 
All your questions again. Uh, Michelle, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to hold questions till the end. I've got a few of them, but uh, I want to make sure we get through to the end smoothly. Okay. So let's just keep those to the end. Okay, pressing on. Mm -hmm. uh, so what materials can create premature uh, corrosion? Mm -hmm. uh, we've already talked about this a little bit. Wet semen is problematic. Soil, dissimilar metals in a uh, corrosive environment. Wet or chemically treated wood is problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, and anything else that would trap moisture up against the surface of the panel uh, without the ability to dry. Uh, so again, you got to consider fasteners and penetrations. Insulation can be a big deal. Sealants and cuts, uh, the integration of other types of materials, field cutting, because that does have to occur, um, and then job site cleaning and maintenance after uh, the product is in place. So this is a galvanic corrosion example we talked about. This is a house in Carlsbad, California, about 100 feet off the surf break. Um, we got a call in 2008 that the paint was failing uh, with this picture. And it had only been installed for maybe a year and a half at that point, so relatively new. And this always comes in as a paint failure claim. And then when we get out there and look deeper, we realize, well, the paint's failing because the substrate's failing underneath. And the reason the substrate's failing is this fastener right here in this clip, which is holding the gutter on, is stainless steel. Hmm? Indirect contact with the galvalume panel hmm? next to the ocean. So the panel is sacrificing itself to protect the stainless steel. And if you, so we went back three years later, it was just getting worse. We scraped the paint back. And what you see is that metallic coating is, is gone and you're down to base steel in this red rust underneath. So obviously there's nothing for the paint to adhere to anymore. But look, the stainless looks fantastic still. Um, this house had stainless steel gutters and fasteners throughout it. Um, it was a bit of a, a mess at the end of the day. Hmm? The other issue we see with fasteners, which looks like galvanic corrosion when you first see it, but is not, is being overdriven. Uh, and this is where having really good installers comes into play. So this is a roof in uh, Hawaii on Maui near the ocean. Um, this screw was uh, is the right type of material. It's uh, zinc coated, it's right, it's compatible, but they overdrove it into the, whoops, into the panel. Uh, breaking through the metallic coating layer, which now allows uh, corrosion to start mm -hmm. around that fastener uh, because you've broken that coating down. Mm -hmm. You know, other penetrations that we have to worry about are, um, you know, AC units, mm -hmm. right? Making sure they're attached with the right materials, making sure that that drainage off of them is good. Uh, copper, right, that's used on roofs for the uh, HVAC systems, uh, making sure that runoff is not happening on the panels. You can see the corrosion that's occurred underneath this uh, setup here. So you can uh, avoid this by a lot of ways, right? Choosing the right materials, using seals um, and protection uh, in between barriers, in between uh, damming it so that the water goes where you want it to. Mm -hmm. Ends and uh, edges and terminations can be problematic, right? So we can't always make a roof panel long enough for the span, so then you've got to overlap mm, um, them. You want to make sure you do that correctly so and seal it correctly so that water can't seep in between those laps. Mm. And what you'll get is actually corrosion from the inside out, right? So that panel will start corroding from the bottom side up. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. But there's a lot of uh, tape sealants and Mastics that can be used to prevent that. Mm. And then insulation. Uh, insulation in and of itself is not a problem, but um, you certainly don't want a situation where the insulation can become wet and stay wet in, in contact with the panel because um, it will cause corrosion. This is an example of a 20 year roof where um, the way it was designed, water could get into the insulation and was held against that panel and you can see it's corroded down to the base steel. Mm -hmm. Spray on insulation is sometimes used, especially in commercial applications. Um, they're usually not problematic, but you got to make sure that the fire retardant in it doesn't have anything corrosive, um, which would be like copper compounds. So we want to make sure those are good. Concrete and mortar is problematic uh, for galvalume too. So it really suffers quickly from wet concrete. Um, and this is an example of where they poured a concrete um, slab right up against um, some panels without a flashing uh, in between. And it just eats away at the panel very, very quickly. 
Mortar splashes on a job site can be problematic too. They need to be cleaned off quickly. They're allowed to sit for a period of time. They will start eating through the coating as well. And again, don't submerge uh, the gavelin product in soil. Wood, obviously there's almost always gonna be some kind of wood uh, used on almost any kind of construction. Green or unseasoned timber is bad because of the uh, acids in it and the water that it holds mm. causes corrosion. So you need uh, kiln dried uh, timber is best. Uh, don't want to place it in direct contact with timbers that are likely to retain moisture. Because again, it'll start to corrode it. Uh, there are some treatments, especially fire retardant treatments that are copper based uh, that can leach out and be problematic as well. So it's always good to, to ask for what the treatments are. And, and we have a list. It's actually spelled out in the warranties um, for this product, uh, what treatments can and can't be used with it. Mm -hmm. Storage and handling, right? Once these panels are up, they do incredibly well as far as corrosion protection and uh, longevity, but you know, you gotta handle them a little bit carefully on the ground and in storage first. So, right, long panels especially need to be carried and handled in such a way that you don't uh, dent them or flex them or, or kink them before installation. And then you need to keep it dry and protected while it's in bundle forms. While these panels are on the ground before installation, they're actually more prone to corrosion then than they are once installed. And there's a lot, uh, the National Coil Coaters Association has some really good guidelines and videos on how to properly um, store and protect this material. Field cutting, right? We try to make all the panels the right length in the factory, but there's always some cutting that's needed at a job site. So you want to make sure that you, uh, first of all, use the right cutting tools. Again, there's a technical bulletin on that. Uh, you want to hide those cut edges if you can, um, away from the environment. Make sure that the burr is down, um, you know, bend or, or um, you know, tweak the ends down so that the rain doesn't collect and hold. It can run off cleanly. So, especially in severe marine and industrial environments. Um, field cuts should probably be field painted or sealed with something uh, to protect them. Site cleanup. This is the other, uh, as opposed to the galvanic corrosion, this is probably the second biggest complaint I see on new installations. And I'll get a call saying, hey, um, you know, my roof is only two months old and it's rusting. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really rusting. It's usually because someone didn't clean something else up properly at the site. So this uh, swarf especially. So those are metal filings that occur uh, at the site due to cutting uh, in the field, uh, putting the fasteners in, you get these little shavings of metal that fly around everywhere. If you don't clean those up, uh, they stick to the surface and they start to rust. So it's not the panels rusting, it's these debris on the surface rusting which isn't going to cause the roof to fail by any means, but it looks terrible um, because once it started to corrode, it leaves a red stain that's very, very hard to get off, um, almost impossible to clean off. So you need to make sure that the installers are cleaning all that up every day, washing it down good so it doesn't stick. And then again, uh, you want to make sure that you don't just don't leave anything laying around that's going to cause corrosion long term. Get everything off that roof, uh, roof as quickly as possible. So maintenance is required, right? I like to always use the analogy of your car. You don't buy a brand new car and never clean it and expect the paint to last very long, right? <laughs> the surface to last very long. So hmm. most of the warranties and most panel manufacturers will have cleaning and maintenance guidelines that should be followed. Usually a mild detergent uh, is suitable and is safe to use. At the very least, you need to be rinsing uh, roofs down, you know, once or twice a year and making sure there's no buildup of debris uh, that's trapping moisture. And this is an example of, um, you know, where maintenance just hasn't been done, right? And water's been allowed to pool. Debris has been allowed to collect uh, and not cleaned off. So we're at the end. I think I have a minute left. So in summary, right, we went over the four uh, sort of categories here, what this coating is and why and how it was developed, what it's used for, and the best way to, to use it and install it and maintain it for, um, you know, to get that 30 to 50 years out of it that we're seeing in the field. So do we have time for questions, Paul? Yes, we do. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Great presentation. And we do have a few questions uh, from folks. Um, 
one of them is an, an interesting question about uh, Wi-Fi in like large school areas and does, I don't think it would be unique to uh, aluminum zinc coated roofs, but it would be just any kind of uh, steel based roof. Does that interfere with Wi-Fi signals? Not that I'm aware of. And actually I would say almost, well, I don't know, out here on the West anyways, I think almost every school I drive past has a steel roof on it. Mm -hmm. So no, not an issue that I'm aware of. Good. Uh, and, and this question from Daniel is uh, one that's going to create a lot more work for you, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, okay. Do you handle roof specs from architects and help them uh, identify? Are, are there people at uh, Steelscape who handle that kind of thing? They want to, he wants to make sure he address all the requirements, such as galvanic action, fasteners, yeah, flashing, that, and that sort of thing. The answer is yes and no. That would typically be routed through the panel manufacturer. So like Steelscape's customer or you know, our ASC division does panel manufacturing and engineering. So it would be routed through them. So yes, uh, a good panel manufacturer is going to have someone that can assist with that and go over it. And yes, they do sometimes find their way to me just to make sure everyone's on the same page. But um, the panel companies uh, should really be able to handle that as the first line of defense. Great. And I, this is kind of related to that question also, uh, because it's probably from the panel companies, but are, are there uh, installation certification programs? Uh, and I know that's probably associated with warranty programs as well. Yes, there are there are end users out there in manufacturers who do that, that kind of certification and educational uh, support for installers. Um, and, and typically we'll also have a list of preferred installers that they work with to recommend. Um, you know, if you don't know where to go. Um, uh, Ray notes that uh, might no, note also that carbon black is highly corrosive on galvanic roofs. Yes, that's a very good one. And that's, um, and I, I think it was on there, but I didn't say it. One of the slides, um, graphite pencils, lead-based pencils, right? Shouldn't be used on this product to market with because it causes issues. Um, and then we'll ask the final question here uh, from Alex, and I don't know whether it's unique to uh, uh, aluminum zinc coated roof panels uh, about protection from lightning. Um, is there anything unique about them as opposed to protecting any other metal roof? Or I didn't any get other protection from what? Lightning. Protection. Oh, lightning. Uh, yeah, you would want to treat it the same as any other um, metal roof, same as galvanized or aluminum or anything else. Well, it, Michelle, that, what a great presentation. You always do a great job. Thank you so much. I, just, I really enjoyed this one. Um, for the audience, if you want more information, you can go to steelscape.com. And uh, a reminder that the AIA credits and certificates are going to be handled automatically. And please allow seven business days for that to be processed. Tomorrow, you're going to receive emails about links to a web page where you can view this webinar again. Um, but Michelle, great presentation. You're always fantastic. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, we're doing another webinar on July 23rd on insulated roof decks that's brought to you by all weather insulated panels. Uh, you can catch all of our webinar schedule at metalarchitecture.com slash 2020 hyphen events. Thank you all for attending and Michelle, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks everyone.